Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 3, The Stone Age. The further back in history we look, the less secure is our knowledge of the specific details. This is especially true during the prehistoric period, which is the period before there is writing. True history in the sense of specific events involving specific people would not begin until the development of writing. What we think we know derives from two sources, archaeology and oral tradition and later myths and legends. Both have their limitations, though. Those of legend are clear enough. Stories grow and are distorted as they are handed down orally from generation to generation. Circumstantial detail often derives only from the storyteller's imagination. Then, when writing did develop, the early historians used these myths as historical fact in reconstructing the early history of the Greeks. Modern historians thus must treat these tales with skepticism, although it is possible that some of them contain small elements of truth. Archaeology deals directly with the raw material of history, but it must be interpreted. Conclusions often have to depend on samples and the samples may be unrepresentative or insufficient. Plus, new evidence can be unearthed that radically changes our interpretation. So keep in mind that until the advent of writing, all dates are approximate and subject to controversy. With that warning out of the way, let's try and piece together a narrative for the earliest dwellers of the Greek mainland and the Aegean Sea. Our story starts tens of thousands of years ago, in the latter portion of the Stone Age so named because the people primarily used stone, in addition to bone and wood, to make tools and weapons. The Stone Age is conventionally subdivided into three periods. The Paleolithic, which is Greek for Old Stone, Mesolithic, Middle Stone, and Neolithic, New Stone. The first human beings in Greece, and ostensibly Europe, probably migrated there from the African continent, via the eastern Mediterranean and Anatolia which is modern-day Turkey. A hominid skull found in the Petrolona Cave in the Halkidiki Peninsula in northern Greece has been dated to at least 200,000 BC. As early as 50,000 BC, the Neanderthals, whose name arises from the finds of their remains in Germany's Neanderthal Valley, were migrating south into the Balkan Peninsula and then into Greece to avoid the current Ice Age. The plains of Thessaly were particularly popular with hunter-gatherer populations during this period. They went as far south as the plain of Elis in the Peloponnese Peninsula. There, evidence of Neanderthal fossils have been found at the Kalamakia Cave. Anthropologists believe that the first real signs of modern human activity in Greece, with the Homo sapiens, started around 40,000 BC. These early humans are sometimes referred to as Cro-Magnon by archaeologists. In any event, they eventually completely replaced the earlier populations, like the Neanderthals. How this happened remains largely unknown. Perhaps the newcomers were better suited to cope with natural disasters. Perhaps tremendous floods covered the plain of Thessaly for many years and forced the populations there to flee to the surrounding hills, where food would have been harder to find. We may never know the real reason, sadly. The first evidence of Homo sapien activities can be seen at the Frankly Cave, overlooking the Argolic Gulf on the eastern part of the Peloponnesus Peninsula. These hunter-gatherers started calling the cave home as early as 20,000 BC, and would inhabit the cave for the next 17,000 years, providing a treasure trove of finds for archaeologists. So that's our best guess at a chronology for the Paleolithic inhabitants of Greece. I want to note that it would be misleading to refer to these people at this early date as Greeks in the same sense in which that term is applied to the region in historical times. There is no evidence, such as language, to allow us to distinguish clearly among different ethnic groups in prehistoric Europe on the criteria used for populations of later periods. Regional differences among prehistoric European populations probably existed, but we are not in a position today to identify them confidently. Therefore, during the Paleolithic period, the inhabitants of Greece were, as far as we can tell, a subset of the general population of prehistoric Europe at large. Archaeological excavation of prehistoric sites allows us to reconstruct a bare-bones outline of the life of Paleolithic hunter-gatherers. These people banded together into small groups and roamed throughout their lives in search of food. Men hunted large game, while the women and children gathered edible plants, fruits, and nuts close to home to be shared among one another. Preparing food with fire was an especially important innovation 
because it converted plants that were indigestible and raw, such as wild grains, into edible and nutritious meals. At some point, dogs were domesticated to hunt alongside man. Living as hunter-gatherers, these early human beings sometimes migrated great distances, presumably following large animals or searching for more abundant sources of nutritious wild plants. Basically, they were at the mercy of the environment, as their lives were dominated by the relentless search for food. The Paleolithic period is considered to end after the last Ice Age, around 10,000 BC, at which point we enter the Mesolithic period, which is a transition into the Neolithic period and is characterized by the development of agriculture. The exact dates varies widely with each region. In any event, evidence at the Frankthe Cave suggests that as Greece warmed up again to its current climate, the rising ocean levels from these melting ice sheets forced them to adapt to survive. With erosion of the shore, large animals didn't have a place to graze, and so they left. The hunter-gatherers could have chosen to follow them, but instead they chose to be innovative in order to survive. They hunted smaller animals, gathered wild plants such as lentils, oats, and barley, and took to the sea to fish. In doing so, they probably went out in small boats made of reeds and skins. At the cave, archaeologists also found hard volcanic glass-like obsidian, used for knives, razors, sickles, and other small tools that need a sharp edge. Obsidian can only be found at Milos, an island in the southern Cyclades. This means that these people already were trading via the sea. With the primitive tools available for boat or raft building, a journey to Milos must have been a hazardous adventure for sure. Since hunter-gatherer populations came to depend increasingly on plants for their survival, they needed to develop a reliable supply. The answer, which took thousands of years of repeated trial and error to learn, was to plant part of the seeds from one crop to produce more of that crop. Wild crops, such as oats, barley, and lentils, were now being harvested. Knowledge of this revolutionary technology, agriculture, first emerged in the Near East and slowly spread outward. Evidence from the Frankthe Cave and the Plain of Thessaly shows the new technology had reached Greece by around 7000 BC. How the knowledge of agriculture made it to Greece is unknown. It may have been introduced to Greece by newcomers from western Anatolia. Regardless, Neolithic women probably played a major role in inventing agriculture. After all, Women in hunter-gatherer societies had developed the greatest knowledge of plants, because they were the principal gatherers of it. During this same transitional period, people also learned to breed and herd animals for food, thus helping to provide the meat formerly supplied by hunting large mammals, many of which would have been hunted to extinction by now. The first animals to be domesticated as a source of meat were sheep and goats. The production of food laid the foundation for other monumental changes. Because to farm successfully, people had to live in settled locations. Permanent communities of farmers, comprising a built environment with a densely settled population, constituted a new stage in human history. Sizable Neolithic villages sprang up in Macedonia, at Nea Nicomedia, and further south in Thessaly, at Sesclo and Domini, by 5000 BC, concentrated in the few plains suitable for agriculture. Since most of its land wasn't arable, Greece had a speed bump in its developmental history because its food resources couldn't support a massive population boom like what was happening in the Near East at this time. It would be thousands of years before Greece caught up. The permanent houses of these early settlements were mostly one room, freestanding, in a rectangular shape, and were up to about 12 meters long. At Seslo, some Neolithic houses had basements and a second story. They were usually built with a wood frame daubed with clay, but some had stone footings supporting mud bricks. The inhabitants entered through a single door and baked food in a clay oven attached to the back or side wall. At Domini, a series of low walls encircled a settlement. Settlements like those at Sesclo and Domini had populations of perhaps several thousand each. The production of agriculture also led to the development of pottery, since they would need vessels to store the food in. Because of its importance for dating, pottery has been studied extensively and will be mentioned often on this podcast. Pottery is classified into styles that separate chronology. The earliest pottery in Neolithic Greece was without decoration. But during the Middle Neolithic period, artists would paint or incise linear patterns on the surface, often in the form of zigzag lines. By the end of the Neolithic period, 
Pottery was becoming increasingly sophisticated. The basic type of pots are much the same or with slight differences throughout Greece, indicating that there must have been communication and trade taking place. Archaeologists have found many baked clay sculptures from this time, many of which are of women, called Venus figurines, after the Roman goddess of sexual love, whose Greek equivalent is Aphrodite. They are sculpted with extra-large breasts, abdomens, butts, and thighs, all suggestive features of fertility. The traditional belief is that they represented the mother goddess, whose fertile abundance gave them life. Their exaggerated features suggest that the people to whom they belonged maintained beliefs about fertility and birth and may even had communal rituals. Needless to say, Neolithic people didn't have a modern understanding of science, so things like pregnancy and birth must have been an object of wonder. This was only mystified with the agricultural miracles of germination and growth. Female figures dominate Neolithic statuette art, although male figures also exist. Males are chiefly distinguished by a projecting phallus. These figurines were not at all standardized, and they show up in a variety of postures and shapes and sizes. Since the community could produce enough food without everyone having to work in the fields or herd cattle, some workers could become craft specialists, producing goods for those producing the food. These artisans not only fashioned tools and containers from the traditional materials of wood, bone, hide, and stone, but also developed new technological skills by experimenting with metal around 4000 BC. Other workers specialized in weaving textiles. In addition to craft specialization, Trade also played a role in the economy of these early villages. The trading contacts the villagers made with other settlements meant that their world did not consist merely of isolated communities. A consequence of the increasing specialization of labor was the emergence of a social and political hierarchy. The need to organize the exchange of food and goods between farmers and craft specialists created a need for leaders with greater authority than had been required to maintain peace and order in hunter-gatherer bands. In addition, households that found success in farming, herding, crafts production, or trade made themselves wealthier, and thus different from less successful villagers. There developed different social classes, based upon how much was generated, concepts not normally seen in tribal societies, where resources were pulled together so the tribe can survive. Gradual changes in agriculture and herding over many centuries perhaps contributed to the social, political, and legal inequality between men and women, characteristic of the historical period. Farmers began to employ plows dragged by animals sometime around 4000 BC in order to cultivate more difficult land. Men operated this new technology, perhaps because plowing required more physical strength than digging with sticks. Men also tended to the large herds, who grazed at a distance from the village, because new grasslands had to be found continually. By contrast, women became tied down in the home, because they had to raise more children than before to support agriculture, which was increasingly becoming more intensive and therefore required more laborers. Women also produced clothes by spinning and weaving the wool. It's possible that men's tasks were given greater prestige and thus contributed to the growth of inequality between genders. This form of social differentiation which became a fundamental ingredient in Greek culture, thus apparently emerged as a contingency of the fundamental changes in human life taking place in the late Neolithic period. The Neolithic period is considered the most revolutionary period in human development, as the hunter-gatherer society began to settle in villages and domesticate animals and plants, laying the foundation for the rise of civilizations. In the next episode, we will add bronze to the equation and examine the early developments of the Bronze Age civilizations in the Aegean Sea and Greek mainland. So tune in next time to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 4, The Early Bronze Age. I would like to give a special thanks to the amazing artist Michael Levy for allowing me to feature his music on this podcast. He transports you to the ancient world, bringing to life the melodies and using the techniques of the past. A new song will be played every episode. This one is titled, him to the Stars, from his new album, The Ancient Greek Cathar of Classical Antiquity. If you like what you heard, and are curious to learn more about ancient Greek music, check out his website at ancientlyre.com. His albums are available in every major digital music store, including iTunes, Amazon, and Spotify.